Hey, we're live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Byer in Chicago. I'm here in Chicago. Chris, how are you doing on this fine day in the month of May? May. Oh, I, I'm doing well. Um, nice, cold and gray and wet here in London, but um, nice. You know, keeping busy with my SOE thing and Battle of Britain and seeing my fair city. Excellent. Well, we will wait a moment for people to join us to get started yeah. for real. And please post something to let us know that you're here. Chris, we haven't really been saying hi to people at the beginning when they post. So shout out a couple of people there. Uh, well, Stephen Dean from who just from Beaverton, Oregon, and JK and uh, from New York, Kevin Berger, Lizzie Borden, of course, from London. I see Gene Templin and John yeah. Matthew. From sunny Toronto, yes. he's just rubbing it in there. I think Chris. I know he is. And Wally Morrison from Iceland. All right. And um, uh, we want to welcome hey, you as you're as you're all joining us to History Happy Hour, which is brought to you with the support and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical, historical Tours. Tours. Yeah. And we are glad that people are finding us here. In uh, you know, and that you didn't get lost trying to get here. Maybe some of you did, but well, people will get here eventually. We hope. Uh, and uh, we're here talking about history every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on the History Happy Hour uh, YouTube and Facebook pages. And so all of our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. And uh, by the way, I just want to say we're always interested uh, in your feedback on our audio. We've gotten some in the past. We think oh. we've uh, made things a little better. So you should just feel free to give us a little feedback on that as we go along. Rick promises to take voice lessons. For I am working on <laughs> my delivery. Um, hello, uh, ladies um, and gentlemen. Hello there. And all uh, the ships at sea. Yes. Uh. And so, Chris, you've been uh, bombing around London and you, you ran into something uh, interesting and kind of a little sad. Uh, yeah. you want to tell us a little bit about that? So, you know, as I've, I've I've been mentioning I've been doing a lot of um, walking around the city looking at sites for the SOE tour um, but one of the things that I came across uh, is probably well is the, the last ship's chandlery uh, in London and um, for those of you who don't know that's where you would go to get all their bits and bobs before you sailed your boat around the ocean blue to visit some of the different pink bits that were controlled by Great Britain uh, and this shop here Arthur Beale um, believe it or not, has been in existence for 500 years. Uh, and when you go inside, it's just like a Dickens novel. Um, and it's a, a really wonderful place. But sadly, very, very sadly, um, they didn't, they, they fell victim to COVID. So um, the foot traffic just wasn't coming in anymore. Ooh. So after 500 years, um, I got to walk by at the Arthur Beale going out of business sale. Which oh, is really, kind of sad. But I just, am, you know, imagine a place being in business for five hundred years. Um, no, and and yeah, that's it's amazing. And Chris, I, but that is sad. So we have to temper that with some good news. Yes. And I'm, I'm opening my beer because I know that I'm going to have to raise a glass to the Ghost okay. Army. Oh wait, Thank you can't say Ghost Army and then talk about it. You have to. So that's two drinks. Okay. Well, it's a big week for the Ghost Army. Uh, the Ghost Army gold medal bill passed in the House mm -hmm. on Tuesday, the bill to award that World War II deception unit a congressional gold medal. And uh, Marilyn and I were watching on C-SPAN oh, and man. toasted that amazing moment. And now we are working to lobby the Senate to uh, honor this unit. And anybody who wants to join, you know, reach out, send me an email, and we'll, we'll help you be part of that effort. And when does the Senate make its decision? Oh, they, the Senate takes its time, Chris. <laughs> Could be a uh, while, but it's got to happen there. in the next uh, in the next year or so. So, uh, you have to you have to have patience. So, uh, have we killed enough time to uh, to get our show underway? Kill, yes, I think so. All right, that, we'll give give us the cue. Uh, brrr. <laughs> Is open. The bar is open, and I'm sure our guest is like, "When are they going to get to me?" So maybe we should maybe we should do that, Chris. We let's do that. So um, for those of you uh, who've been watching us all along, you know that one of the areas that we haven't covered yet 
uh, is the Vietnam War, and it's something that Rick and I have been anxious to do. Um, and we think we finally hit upon uh, a great book to start this. Uh, we're going to be talking about a book called Cat Killer 3-2 which is written by a man named Raymond Carroll. And Mr. Carroll um, has probably one of the more unique uh, experiences or views of uh, his time in Vietnam. Uh, and he's talking a lot about flying fixed-wing aircraft uh, as an artillery uh, to ca carry artillery observers uh, supporting Marines and I-Corps. And it's a, it's a really unique uh, and fascinating look at uh, the Vietnam War. So. And Here's Ray. And here's our guest, <laughs> so he can explain more about it. Hello, Raymond. Uh, good afternoon, gents. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Good. Put a little light on the subject. There you go. There you go. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay, Chris, you can you you can you start us off here with a Yeah, well, so f folks, um, uh, one of the, I guess one of the popular uh, impressions about the Vietnam War is uh, either of helicopters, I think, or... B-52s, when you're talking about aircraft, you don't really think about small, tiny little fixed-wing aircraft flying around the jungle. At least I, I hadn't um, until I came across this book, and we're going we're gonna to kind of fix that problem tonight. Um, uh, Mr. Carroll, if you could just kind of give us some idea, briefly to start <laughs> with, how you came to be flying a little Cessna aircraft in Vietnam. That's not something you usually picture people doing in Vietnam. Uh, the very beginning was because I was nice to a lady on the telephone. That it worked. See, politeness helps. Politeness oh, helps. helps. Always a great, very underrated. I very quickly. I had uh, been in jump. I was in jump school at Fort Benning. Talked to another lieutenant who said he was waiting to go to flight school. I said, "How'd you do that?" He said, "I went down. And I took a test. And I took a physical, and I'm waiting to go to flight school." So. Where, where do I start? Uh, go to personnel. So I did that, took the test. The guy said, highest score I've seen since I've been here for a year and a half. You're probably going to go. i got to do a physical pass that. Next thing I know, I get a letter from infantry branch. Uh, I was infantry uh, in Depart Department of the Army. And uh, I said, you're, you're going to go to flight school. We don't, have, we don't have a class date for you yet, but if you have any questions, feel free to call this phone number and the lady will talk to you. Well, I had questions, so I did, and I talked to this lady. I thought she was a secretary, and I was nice to her, and I, I introduced myself, and I said, basically, oh. mind. That was my big concern, because I'm a little speck in this giant army. Yeah. Right. And uh, she said, no, no, you're going to flight school. I, I said, well, can I check in with you from time to time just to see where I'm at? She says, you can call me every week if you want, which I did. And kind of got to know her. I don't, I don't recall her name, but I got to know her. And, and uh, she was always reassuring me that I was going to flight school, that they wouldn't change their mind. And, and then after about five weeks, I got this uh, phone call from her. And she said, uh, if you want to go to flight school next month, I can send you to helicopters. Or if you're willing to wait two or three months, I'll send you to fixed wing. Well, I had wanted to fly fixed wing aircraft. So again, I asked her, I said, can, if I choose fixed wing and turn down helicopters, will anybody change their mind? And that's when her voice kind of changed. She says, I don't think you realize who you're talking to. And I thought, oh, I oh, really. Well, that's a sentence you never want to hear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I went, ooh. And, and then she laughed and she said, I am the one who makes the flight school assignments for infantry branch. So who I was talking to was a civilian female who worked at the Department of the Army Infantry Branch and say they got uh, 30 allocations every month for helicopters and three allocations every month for fixed wing because the fixed wing classes were much, much smaller than the rotary wing classes. And, and she would be the ones that peeled off so many for the helicopters and so many for the fixed wing. I am the only infantry officer that I, that I know of that I've ever talked to during the Vietnam conflict who got to pick between helicopters and fixed wing. And I and people ask me, how did you get to fixed wing flight training? And I always saw I was just nice to a lady on the telephone. So, so, that, so great start. Um, and, and so tell us, a, you're you're in a in a unit um, 
uh, that the the uh, call sign of is the the cat killers. Your cat mm -hmm. killer three two. No cats yeah. were killed in the making of this uh, book. Uh, we want to just be clear to everybody. Um, but w who? What are the cat killers? Why? Why exactly <coughs> are you flying a Cessna a thousand feet above the the DMZ in or 1968 less. or less or at less. times? Yes. As things were gearing up in Vietnam in 1965, the Marine Corps was assigned the I Corps Tactical Zone. There were four tactical zones. Northernmost one was I Corps, and then two Corps, then three Corps, then four Corps. And uh, um, the unit was formed at Fort Lewis, Washington in 1965. Uh, the commanding officer, then Major Curry, later on retiring as a, a uh, Lieutenant, Gen Lieutenant General, Yes, from the Army. Um, he decided to go with the advanced party, and they thought they were going to be assigned to an area near Saigon. He got there, and concurrent with that arrival, the Marines had realized that since their mission had been changed from clear, hold, pacify, which is what they thought they were going to be doing when they walked on the beach at Da Nang in, in March of 1965, General Westmoreland has said, no, you're going to change all that, and it's going to be search and destroy. Well, the Marines realized they did not have enough bird dogs which is the little Cessna, Cessna airplanes, to, to control the fixed wing, and they knew they were going to be doing a lot of bombing and that kind of stuff. So they turned to the Army and they said, we need, we need help, we need bird dogs up here. And the Army told them, well, uh, we, we've got a bird dog company that just showed up, why don't we just send them up there and you can have them. <clears throat> That's how I wound up flying in an Army unit under the operational control of the Marines. And we stayed under their operational control from 1965 until the Marines left I Corps in the fall of 1969, at which time then that unit, which was still there until December 71, that unit fell directly under the control of, of the Army. And things really changed drastically for the guys who were there then. Um, we, just a, what set us apart from all the other Army bird dog units in Vietnam, I believe there was a total of seven of them before it was over. Um, the Marines chose to train us as tactical air controllers airborne. The Air Force equivalent is FAC, forward air controller. In other words, we were, we were allowed and we were trained and taught by our uh, Marine Corps backseaters how to run the fixed wing aircraft. And um, the Air Force didn't want us to do that, but the Marines said, we are running I Corps. And they'll be, he'll be controlling, they'll be controlling our jets. We will train them how to do it, and they're going to be there doing it. And um, that's the short story of how the cat killers uh, got to be very unique in, in terms of uh, the total mission. We, we adjusted artillery. We adjusted naval gunfire. Most of the bird dog units, Army units, didn't get to do that. And we were able to run. We were fixed-wing uh, controllers running for close air support. Um, that set us apart. <clears throat> so, so right, right, just so again, because most people don't even know about the role of the cat killers or, or the or the bird dogs, I should say. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're flying unarmed Cessnas, <laughs> low and slow, yeah, over combat. Right? Okay, that just seems totally logical to me. About a hundred miles um, an hour. How many? How, Okay, great. So, about how many aircraft are we talking about here, like overall, and, and what type of aircraft are you using? Because when I it, it's when a, I read it's it, I went. it's a Cessna, uh, and originally it's a Korean vintage airplane. And, and um, just before the Korean War, the the Army sent out a, a request for bid on uh, making a new airplane that would that would. Uh, fit certain parameters that they could use to adjusting artillery. That was the Army's goal, to adjust artillery. And Cessna won the contest. Uh, Cessna also had a contest to name the aircraft. And the winning thing was bird dog, I guess because the bird dog goes out and finds whatever the prey is you're looking for, and then once they find them, then you take care of them. So that's, that's how it won. Uh, which ran counter to, with the exception of the Huey, almost and the Huey Cobra, all other Army aircraft are named after a uh, an, an Indian tribe, um, the Kiowa, the Apache, the, 
all and on and on, but there's just a few like the Blackhawk, well, the Blackhawk Indians. Um, but the bird dog got its own name and they did use them in Korea and then they continued to use them as trainers. And then all of a sudden for this role, because we could, we could stay up close to four hours. Um, your average Huey could stay up about an hour and a half and he had to go back and get gas. Uh, because we could stay up a long time and because you could see out of both sides of the aircraft because you sat in tandem. It was just an excellent aircraft for, for doing visual reconnaissance, looking for the targets. Uh, that picture, by the way, is the Benhai River that divides North and South Vietnam. And all those little bright circles you see filled with water are either artillery, shell craters, or bomb craters. It was like flying around the surface of the moon when you got up on the DMZ. That is the DMZ right there. So that's what we did. Uh, we went out and looked for trouble. When we found it, uh, then we brought in artillery or brought in fixed wing and, um, or naval gunfire, whatever we needed. And we, the interesting thing about all that is we would go right through what they call the, the direct air support control system and the DASC, we called it. And we'd call them and we'd say, we need a flight of fixed wing. We would get them almost immediately. They'd be coming off the hot pad at two light to, to do whatever we wanted them to do. Whereas on the ground, the ground guys that they were calling for, for air support like that, they would have to go through a chain of command and oftentimes that delay the arrival by, you know, as much as an hour or so. So we had, as, as young lieutenants and captains, we had at our beck and call more firepower then in a lot of cases, then battalion commanders, field grade officers said, and we could get it. And we were never, in my year there, was I ever counter, uh, would anybody ever question uh, what we called for or anything else? They just... And how, really how, old, how old were you when you were doing this, Raymond? How, when you have... How old I have you? to think a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what was it's I, 1968, 20, right? 68, yeah. I was about 25 years old at the time. So. Okay. Yeah, uh, a pretty young. I, I, I just have to, I have a question coming up, but I do, I do. I think Neil Shara is very excited to be here because this is his comment. Uh, ah. Yeah, which, which I'll, I'll let you interpret that, uh, 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 Ray. What's he, what's he telling us there? 1,200 rounds of 20 millimeters, Mark 82 Snake Eye. Well, he's obviously flying something that I didn't. I can't see <laughs> what aircraft he's flying. But he's got 20 mic mic. <clears throat> they call them pistols. The fighter jocks, they call them, that's pistols. And so they'd show up and they'd say, uh, we've got, uh, you know, six um, Mark 82s or whatever they had. Each, each different type of ordnance had its own uh, nomenclature. But the, the standard close air support armament that the, A4, the Marine Corps A4s would show up when we'd call for them, they'd have six 250-pound high drag, we call them snake eyes, when they drop the bomb, the fins pop out so that, by the time that the, the the it allows them to drop lower and so they're out of there the fins slow the bomb down so they're out of there before it hits the ground and blows up and throws shrapnel all over the place so um they'd show up with napalm snake and we call it snake and nape and they'd tell us if, if they had you know they always had pistols they always had 20 mike mike and we would we didn't use that first we we'd have them get rid of the napalm first because um, we wouldn't want them taking ground fire and have one of those napalm things hanging under the wing going off mm. on them. So we'd have them uh, unleash the napalm first. I think you got a picture showing a, a nape strike. And then the 250-pound bombs. And I have to tell you guys this. Uh, the Marine yes, a You can see, by the way, I, 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 just going to interrupt you, Ray, sure. in the photo that you sent us, the napalm's there right in the middle of the screen almost. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. you, can, you it, can see it. It's just hit. Unfortunately, my wing strut... It, that's sticking up there on the right hand side that dark shadow the the marine corps a4 that had dropped that is behind that wing strut so you can't see him but he came from your left to your right so you see it splashing uh from left to right and um that was some pretty nasty stuff um the a4s were incredibly accurate um just it was just in, incredible working with those guys they uh if you were in dire straits, that's who you wanted the yeah. A4s. So, well, so I, I, I go, go ahead, ahead, Chris. Go, you know, you no, can go I, ahead. Was, I was just going to tease Neil, so I'll do that later. Go ahead. Uh, 
No, tease Neil now. <laughs> well, so Neil Neil is a, is a very good friend of mine, and he's a he's an old fighter pilot. And I just want to say that Neil, after reading Raymond's book, I realized that you know you might be hot stuff in your jet there, but Ray, you really needed Raymond to actually see what was going on to tell you what to do. Tell so, you what to do without the Cessna, Neil. You're <clears throat> you're, well, you're no good. You're, you're you're spot on on that because that's what, <laughs> that's no that's what we were used for, and uh, my unit carried four 2.75 inch rockets and they were willy peats which is white phosphorus and the white phosphorus rocket when it impacts it, there's billowing white smoke that, that emits out of there for about three four minutes which gives me time to adjust I'm, I'm, I've already given them a run-in heading uh, which way to turn when they come off I've given them the, the elevation of the whatever their target is where the nearest friendlies are and where the bad guys are and where I'm going to be. And that's the basic rundown. And you, and then you tell them what you want them to drop and you clear them hot for every run. And, uh, then you move them around from that Willie Pete. You might say hit my smoke. If you, if you were accurate enough with that Willie Pete, we didn't have any sighting mechanism. If you were, but at, over time you got pretty accurate with them. Or you might say, uh, using the clock system with their run-in heading at 12 o'clock, you might say uh, 3 o'clock, 20 meters. That's where you want them to drop. And so they had a reference point that they could sight in on so that they could start their drop. And then and then you would adjust each drop after that. <clears throat> you had to clear them hot for every run they made when they were uh, in direct support of, of troops on the ground, which is called close air support. And believe me, there were times... When it was close, very close. Well, you mentioned that one time when the the you were kind of there was a B fifty two strike going on. Well, well, that was a different deal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the B fifty two strike was known as arc lights, and they would uh, they would put out a, a transmission usually about ten minutes before the B fifty twos were set to come in and drop, and you, you couldn't see them. They're at, you know, 25, 30,000 feet. You might see contrails, but, you know, we were ground oriented. We were spending more time looking at the ground anyway. But they would say off of channel 109 to 285 at 25. And on our maps, we kind of had some lines and marked and everything. So we kind of knew where that was going to be. And you'd stay clear of there until after the arc light was over. And if you kind of took, you know, looked over in that direction, you could see the trees coming down and stuff flying all over the place. An arc light, uh, uh, each B-52 had, I'm trying to think now, it was over 100 uh, 750-pound bombs. They would, they, it was amazing. With the, and then they'd fly in a cell of three. And where I got caught was I had been working with, we had been working with guys on the ground, and somebody had come up on the guard channel. Somebody had been shot down, and they start talking on a guard channel, and that was interfering with our ability to communicate with the guys on the ground who needed some direct air support. <clears throat> so I reached up, and I my UHF radio has transmit receive plus guard, and I flipped it to just transmit and receive, so I didn't have to listen to that what was going on in the guard channel uh, in the background, and I forgot to flip it back. And so we're droning around up there right along the DMZ, and I missed the call, and all of a sudden I'm looking out in front of me, and I see the, the vegetation flying up and explosions coming at me. And I thought, holy cow, what's that? Well, right away you figure, well, that's an arc light. So I turn to the right 90 degrees to fly out of it, not realizing that there were three of those guys up there. <laughs> and about that time I noticed... The other two guys, they all drop at once, but they fly in a V formation. I noticed the other line of explosives, so I did a 180, still not realizing there were three of them, to fly out of it the other direction. And by then, my observer in the back seat is yelling, at, what in the, I won't tell you what he said, but what are you doing? <laughs> and, I, and I said, uh, we're in the middle of an arc light. And in, in other words, the, the 750-pound bombs are going by us. <laughs> striking the ground and I start I immediately started climbing thinking well I, the further away I can if something doesn't directly hit us if it goes by us I don't want to be hit by chunks of mud and dirt and whatever's flying up so I started climbing and uh, and I and I told him then I was going to go back straight and he says 
Well, all right. He says, I'm going to start praying. But if we survive this, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> uh, he didn't, but I never uh, neglected to, t to turn the uh, back to guard so I could hear what was going on. That was yeah, just a like, gross error. You, you learn lessons that, that can, that's a good way to, to, to learn something. Uh, some a question that's come in and, and a perfectly reasonable question uh, to ask here, uh, which is uh, where does the name cat killer come from? What's what's okay. what's with your call sign? I I thought I asked a lot of guys who were with the unit when they when they first formed at Fort Lewis and what I got was well we think one night after everybody was at the club somebody was driving back to the BOQ on the sidewalk and ran over a cat. Well I, uh, no, that's not right. What I finally found out was there was when they put the airplanes together at Saigon and they were flying them north to go to Fubai where the company headquarters was going to be. They were going to go through the Da Nang area and Da Nang had, had a huge Air Force airfield and everything. And you had to clear your way through there with the Da Nang approach so you wouldn't get, you know, conflicted with another aircraft. And so <clears throat> they called, the flight lead called, and he said, this is Army so-and-so, so-and-so. They want to do three, four, five. Uh, request, you know, flight of three or four, flight of four, request permission to pass south to north through your, and the, the controller came back and says, well, what's your call sign? And uh, he said, what do you mean call sign? I gave it army, you know, he says, no, everybody here has a call sign. What's yours? And that's true. All of the aviation units over there had, uh, you know, like the, the, the 280 second assault helicopter company was the black cats. And, Another bird dog unit was were the pterodactyls or the black aces or you know everybody had it. And uh, Dick thought ah, for a moment he thought well for some reason he thought this I don't know. he's still not sure why he says well we're flying bird dogs and dogs kill cats that's what he came up with at the spur of the moment and so he came back with this is cat killer such and such flight of four and Danang approached said well, okay you can go and so it's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, nobody's quite sure why, but it did. It stuck. Um, the, uh, there was a, a bird dog unit in, in two corps. It was called the Headhunters. They had cute little statues of Philippine headhunters and stuff like that. We uh, we were just cat killers. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> we didn't kill cats. It's a very inspiring uh, call sign. <laughs> Rick. That's all I say. Story, right? We're gonna tell you. Can, Chris, can I ask one more here? Yeah, absolutely. Go. Yeah. So, um, uh, so. Uh, recapping, and, and again, I think we're, we're just repeating this because I think it's outside of the experience of a lot of people. You are flying a small Cessna airplane, pretty yeah. low to the ground, yeah. pretty slow. You you yeah. do have a you do have a weapon that like you can aim and fire yeah. out the window, but that's about it. Uh, and you are in support of um, Marine Corps troops, so you yes. are calling in firepower, you're telling people like helicopters or in some cases Air Force jets, uh, fixed wing, as you said, you know, where they can fire to, to support the Marine Corps troops who are on the ground. So talk a little bit about the relationship between Army pilots like yourself and the Marine Corps observers who are in your back seat and the Marines on the ground. Here's the deal. Uh, our Marine Corps aerial observers, they had all been to the 90-day AO school here in, uh, back in the States. And a lot of them had gone over and had been ground commanders uh, on the ground for six months before they, before they got in the backseat of a bird dog. So these guys are very highly trained on, on their job and they, they knew exactly how to do what they did. They would show up every day. Uh, they're the ones that would go to higher level uh, battalion or whatever, and they get the missions, and they, they'd have the call signs and the locations of different Marine Corps companies on sweeps, uh, like in the Quezon Valley or wherever they were. This is, I'm talking about my first half of my tour. They'd show up, and they'd have this, these call signs, and so we'd take off. Now, we had several different missions. We had a north and south coast mission, which was just basically um, looking for boat traffic along the beaches. We also had that uh, visual reconnaissance missions up against the Laotian border. And you showed a, a little picture earlier of a bird dog over the jungle. Um, that, that's triple canopy. If a bird dog 
the engine quit on you or you got shot down, that jungle would swallow you up in a heartbeat and nobody would find you. So those missions up against the Laotian border were always a two-ship mission. One guy was low, about 800 feet above the ground. The other guy was about 500 feet above him. And his job was just to keep track of the low guy. So Because we were outside of the range of artillery support uh, and you just hoped that if, if you got shot down or something that you could survive the crash and then he could get uh, somebody in helicopters or whatever to come find you. So that was that was part of the mission. The mission I liked the most, it had where I, all the action was, was what they call the TAOR, the Tactical Area of Responsibility. And that's where Marine Corps companies would be moving around doing their sweeps, their search and destroy missions. And so we'd saddle up and we'd take off and uh, observe and say, okay, we're going to be d- working with uh, Charlie 24 down uh, down in the Quezon today. So off we go. We fly down there, and then he call him up on the radio and say, "Hey, we're here." And, and you you could tell the radio operator uh, his tone of voice. Uh, they were always glad to see us because we were eyes for them. You know, today they've got UAVs that fly around and they can see with that kind of stuff. But back then we were their their eyes, and we could see things develop that developing for them. Most of the time, they, if they could see beyond 100 yards, they were lucky. But we're flying around over them at 800 feet. We can see a lot, and we can see stuff developing. We can see movement, uh, all kinds of things. So that was the symbiotic relationship that we had with our, with our backseaters because the two of us always worked as a team. And there were times when, uh, when we'd have a, a Marine Corps company in dire straits and he's getting attacked by the bad guys. One of us would be running the artillery and the other was, one of us would be controlling the fixed wing. Typically what they would do is... The, the, and by, the by, fixed the, wing, by fixed wing, you mean Air Force the jets, jets that are jets. coming in with armaments? Marine Corps to, and Air Force yeah. jets. The, okay. the, the, yeah, we call them fixed wing. Right. Uh, they, uh, typically the guy in the front seat, me, the pilot, would run the fixed wing because you can... Because we could turn and see them because we had to clear them hot for each run they made. And in the meantime, the guy in the back is, is running the artillery. But we could swap back and forth, and we could hear what each other was saying. So um, uh, oftentimes we'd be talking to each other, too, saying, well, there's something moving over there on the left flank. You know, we, we just became a very tight-knit team, and it did not take very long. I was, uh, I was surprised at the time, uh, how quickly everything started to flow. And that's because these Marines that were our backseaters, they didn't try to keep anything from us. We were part of a team. And and they were our not only our, our friends, uh, but they were our mentors. And they, you know, it was all about the guys on the ground, taking care of the guys on the ground, and whatever you could do as a team to make that happen. And so, there wasn't any Army versus Marines or anything, certainly not at the operational level. I mean, uh, we were there for one reason, one reason only, and that's to take care of the guys on the ground. And, that, and there's a lot of pride that comes with that, a lot of pride. Well, well, um, well first, I just want to say, Neil, I, I forgot that you also flew every other plane in the Air Force, so apologies for that. So getting back to, you know, I take, I take it all back. But, no, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, though, Raymond, was, I love the fact that you're talking about this close relationship between you and the Marines, mm-hmm. but that's not always the case. In most other situations, these two services don't get Probably. along so well. Yeah. Were there any doctrinal issues that you had as an <clears throat> Army guy all of a sudden having to deal with Marines? Did you have to do things no. a different no. way? We or? were all, <clears throat> for, for almost all of us flying the bird dogs, it was, we had 200 hours of flight time teaching us how to fly the airplane. And then we went off to Vietnam. Today, if you're a civilian pilot and had 200 hours of flying time, nobody's going to put you in an airplane by yourself and ask you to go do a job anywhere as close to what we did. That's just the military, how they work. So here we are over there. We're like little sponges. And uh, fortunately, the Marines that we had in the back seat. And what we would do if we had a new AO, particularly up on the DMZ, because it was very intense up there, if we got a new Marine Corps AO, he would always be paired up with a, with an arm one of our cat killer pilots who who'd been up there for a while. So so there was uh, the learning curve. Uh, you weren't solo on it. Somebody was right there with you the whole time, and and vice versa. If we had a brand new pilot, he got put in uh, with a very experienced aerial observer. Uh, the, my first flight to the DMZ 
was with Major Jess Mulkey, who was the the, the little the detachment commander for the AOs up on the, up on the DMZ. So we had a way of working together that we would bring everybody up to the same standard very quickly. And there was at our level, <clears throat> not a problem. And for me personally, because we were working for the Marines, we were a long ways away from the army flagpole, as I like to say. Yeah. And I really liked it that way. Later <laughs> on, when, when, when the Marines left in November of 69 and they turned I Corps over to the army, the army's 24th Corps, the very first thing that the Air Force did was they went to the Army's 24th Corps and said, the Marines aren't here anymore. We don't want those Army guys controlling our jets. Even though the guys who were there at the time had been doing it, they were qualified to do it, they knew exactly what they were doing. That's the kind of jealousy in turf wars that operate way up there. At the operational level, uh, I never had a flight of Air Force F four say, "Well, are you Army or are you Air Force?" Right. I mean, we all spoke the same language. We knew what we were doing. They were glad you were it. there. I, uh, I I wouldn't trade that year for a million bucks. I swear, guys, I wouldn't. Um, I, I have a we have a bunch of uh, comments and questions, so I'm going to bring a couple of them in. And the first one, sure. I'm going to ask uh, Doug McCord's question. A good, excellent, excellent, clarifying question. He says, "You use the phrase." Clear them hot. Mm -hmm. Define that. What does that mean? We're civilians. What's, <clears throat> you'd set them up. You'd, you'd set the jets the, up into a uh, basically a racetrack pattern, and you're flying much lower than they are, and they only have a limited amount of time because they're jets and they burn a lot of gas when they get close to the ground. So you'd set them up on a racetrack pattern, and you're below them and basically operating inside of them, and you and you plan your turns so that you can see them as they turn their base leg to final. Typically, you'd wind up catching the glint of their wings as they turn base to final. And then you could follow them and see that they were lined up on the heading that you wanted them on. That was very important because you're using the clock system off of their run-in heading, like 3 o'clock or 9 o'clock. If you want to go to the left, it's 9 o'clock. So you, you, you've, you've, you've placed your smoke where you want it, but from then on, you've got to, you've got to make clock use the clock to, to make uh, changes in where they, you want them to drop their ordinance. And so you want to make sure they were lined up correctly. You don't want them coming in over the top of the friendlies and releasing their ordinance because if they got a, something that was released too early, you could hit the good guys. So you always try to run them parallel to, to the front line of your uh, where your guys were on the ground. Um, and the North Vietnamese, they caught on to that real quick, and they had a, a tactic they called grabbing them by the belt, and they would try to work their, themselves up as close as they possibly could to the friendly forces to, to make it harder for our jets to come in and drop their ordnance without, without endangering the friendlies. So cleared hot for every time they were com coming in. The, when they're coming in hot, that means they're getting ready to drop whatever you've told them to drop. And, and you, had, you had to see them. And see, their run-in heading was where, where you wanted them, basically where you want them. And you'd say, cleared hot. And they'd go, Roger, cleared hot. If you didn't say that, they would not drop. And and I just want to know, was the North Vietnamese strategy actually grab them by the belt? Or are you just That's using, what they call it, grab them by the belt. You, are you just using a euphemism the, for our yes. audience for instead of yes. grab them by something They else. would get <laughs> as close as they could to the friendlies yeah. because that made it more difficult Sure. For our for us to, to shoot artillery at them or or run fixed wing at them, uh, so that they would they would there was they their term for that I was told was grab them by the belt. Okay. That was to get as close to it. Chris, can I ask one more audience yeah, question? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So uh, this is from Jay, who wants to know how many bird dog planes were shot down. And of course, uh, that that is probably he's probably thinking about the whole Vietnam War. But answer yeah. any any way you can there. I'm, you know, I, I, I have read the numbers. There, they can they can if you Google Vietnam War number of aircraft shot down, they will. There's a whole laundry list of the helicopters, the F-4s. The, the Air Force lost a ton of over 400 F-4s, 
uh, a ton of 105s. Those guys really had a tough job going into North Vietnam. I think there were probably uh, probably about 300, two, 300 bird dogs that were lost over there. Um, uh, I may be a little bit wrong, but that's kind of a guess. Now, I don't know if they've included that in that number aircraft crashes uh, mm -hmm. we had after i left there was a pilot who, who took off and did something goofy on takeoff and stalled and crashed and killed himself and his observer but the actual cause of that i don't know that i just heard that he, he stalled the aircraft on takeoff mm -hmm. so that means he took off and stalled him. but uh you can google that or oh, but it's hundreds it's hundreds uh, it's, hundreds it's yeah. not three you know, it's no. not. It, this is a this is a, a pretty high stakes business you're involved. Well, in. it was. They the, the 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 reality is they didn't want us to see them. And I got into the habit of flying visual reconnaissance, looking over my shoulders. Because they'd hear us coming, and the the way the army taught us to do visual reconnaissance was to look out at a forty five degree angle in front of you and look up and down. Well. That made no sense at all. They could hear you coming. It, uh, you know, it's your, it's a, an agrarian society. It's basically quiet out there unless something's blowing up. And they would, uh, they'd hear you coming, and so they'd become a bush. They were very good at wearing camouflage. They would become a bush. But it seemed like as soon as your wingtip got past them, they didn't realize you could look back behind yourself. So I, I learned very early on to spend a lot of my time looking over my shoulder. And the, you'd fly by and it's funny little bushes that have faces in them, you know, and then you could see the see the bad guys. So, uh, and we never flew straight and level. That was an absolute no-no. You, you were constantly turning one way or another. So that, um, they, at 100 miles an hour, it, it, an AK-47 will bring you down. And they had learned how to lead us and uh, so you never flew straight level. And later on up on the DMZ, the guys that flew up there would often cross control. So the airplane would be pointed this way, but traveling that way. So it, it would throw them off in their aim. So they, uh, it was harder for them to shoot you down. Uh, in a year of flying over there, I had six bullet holes in my airplane. Um, four of them, I was asking for it. Uh, <laughs> You know, those two came up from the bottom. It's an interesting shot, too. And uh, Let me expound on that just a little bit. The engine is just to the left of those two bullet holes. The firewall is just to the, just to the right of them. There's about a six-inch space between the back of the engine and that firewall. And he fired at me, on, I think, I'm pretty sure, on full automatic because those two bullets went between the firewall and the engine, and they came up through the opening. It's open under the bottom of the engine down there. Uh, they came up through there, and the only bullet holes were the two bullet holes for the bullet. The two bullets left went out. Uh, those are from inside out. Um, I was I'd rolled in, and I was. Uh, you mentioned armament. Uh, we we all carried a pistol, I had a forty-five, and a, and a car fifteen, a little you know, the, a real assault rifle. All right, these had the three selector switch, so you go to full auto, and uh, where the, the civilians, the one they have is just semi automatic. Um, just open the side window and go low and hang your rifle out and shoot at him. Um, and that's what I was doing. I wasn't paying attention to the, his buddy who was hiding behind a bush who kind of opened up on me. But you know, you're young and 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Uh, <laughs> So, Raymond, you know, one of the things that I, I found really interesting was, you know, obviously the, the you talk a lot about your relationship with the Marines. Yes. Um, but you also flew in support of some SF guys. And yep. what I found really interesting was you um, flew in support of Arvins. You had some Arvins. Um, yes. And I, I'm wondering kind of your impressions of those different units and working with them. And, and as a tie-on <coughs> to that, were, were you – you were really busy with your day-to-day -day operations, but did you have a larger sense of the kind of what's going on with the war and what's going on with Because you were there at a busy time. Can, can yeah. I just, uh, can I, yeah, can I offer some definitions on your question, Chris, that uh, uh, SF, Special Forces, I'm Sorry, assuming, yes. Yes. and Arvins is the Army of the, Army Republic, of the Republic of Vietnam, of Vietnam. the South Vietnamese Army. Thank Go ahead, you, Ray. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to hawk the book a little bit here because there is a whole <laughs> chapter on my day out at Thunduck Special Forces Camp, which is about 25 or 30 miles southwest of Da Nang. That was a very enlightening day for me. <clears throat> and we, the cat killers had uh, actually rescued, uh, done a lot in assisting the rescue of the Special Forces guys at, at Ashow uh, when that Special Forces camp was run over and uh, overrun in March of 1966. Um, so we had a, a very close relationship with the special forces guys and they they were kind of down the list in the pecking order so we would <clears throat> this is when i was down the first six months of my tour i flew out of marble mountain which was a smaller airfield right next to Dene, and it was, that was in the first marine division area of responsibility and i used to fly out to thunduck a lot and those guys lived with the natives uh uh if it if you're interested at all in that, I really recommend getting the book and reading that chapter. And you can, you can, you know, it's also available on Kindle or whatever it is. So it's, to me, it was very enlightening because the special forces people work so closely with, with the indigenous people. And there's quite a little tale in there about a sawmill that the special forces guys uh, appropriated, if you will, and hooked it to a, Mercedes-Benz diesel engine so that these folks out there in the, spe in the, in the village at Thundock could make lumber easier. And there's mm. a picture somewhere in that bunch I sent you, I think, of the two guys ripping lumber. Might not have it. but I don't um, have that one. Okay. But there's a lot of activity down by the river. And these guys would use a, like a, a, a buck saw, I guess, back and forth, and they'd saw and make, make lumber. Well, the Special Forces guys built them a sawmill. They had a big party and a big celebration, and uh, about a week later, the village chief came to them and uh, said, Dai Wei, that's Vietnamese for captain, special forces captain, says, uh, we, we, we can't use we can't use that, that sawmill anymore. He said, what's the matter? Is it broken? I mean, we'll fix it. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, the blade is too thick, and it wastes too much wood when it cuts boards. The real reason, that's sociology 101, the real reason behind that was it was putting some of these guys out of work mm -hmm. that were they were actually doing the physical labor of sawing these logs and making lumber out of them. Everybody, what you learn there is that everybody has a place. Everybody wants to work, wants to be a part of the, of the society that exists there. And the special forces guys understood that they put themselves in that environment and um and so they they didn't try to build the and he's and the captain told me he said uh, captain edwards he said that village chief must have sat and stewed over that for that entire week in how to come to me and save face which is very important in that culture to not offend me but to let me know that we really don't want that sawmill. It was nice of you to give it to us, but we really don't want it. So he said, the blade's too thick. It wastes too much wood. So what an enlightening thing for me to spend that day out there. They had a little school. Uh, it was just really cool to be in that. We supported them, and we would go out and we'd fly, do visual reconnaissance for them and stuff like that. The Arvin observers we had, we did not have any of those guys up on the DMZ. The Arvin observers that, that I that I flew with were, was all down at Marble Mountain uh, in the Quezon Valley, and they really didn't go into that area because that's where the Marines were. We would fly these guys back up against the Laotian borders and, and do visual reconnaissance. They'd be looking for river crossings or you know ropes or something across the river or trails. Uh, tr you walk on a trail enough, and from the air it gets shiny, so you could get a feel for how much foot traffic was on a certain trail by how shiny it was. Wow. Um, little cute things. Um, in the mornings, if you fly a, a certain area every morning, that's what we did, all the people would be coming in towards the village, all with their little conical hats and their black pajama outfits, and they'd be carrying, a, we call them chogi sticks. It was like a bamboo stick, and it'd have a, they'd have a basket on either end of it. And the women had a peculiar rolling gait that they would use so that the regular up and down movement of normal, the normal gait of walking, that bamboo would flex up and down and whatever they had in the baskets or buckets would flip out 
so they had a, a rolling gait where they, the upper body didn't move so much and it, it wouldn't cause that thing to go up and down. Well, you'd see this coming towards the village in the morning. Well, if you fly out there one day and, and people are walking away from the village or you see, and, and you could tell the difference in the gait between males and females. And if you saw young males, typically without a hat, just in the Quezon Valley, walking along and they're they're walking along and they're only swinging one arm and they're walking you pretty well rest assured they've got an ak-47 held up against the side of their body on one side as you flew over so these are the telltale things you look for and you got so familiar with that areas like flying around in your own backyard and you'd look for these little um, visual reconnaissance is like taking a picture in the negative you, you see the negative the negative is the way things normally are all the time. So that when you fly over it, all of a sudden you get the color print because something that's unusual sticks out like a sore thumb. And it does. And that those were the cues that, that we learned very quickly that that stuff was never taught to us by the Army in flight school. Um, they, they were behind the times in a lot of ways. And that was another reason why I was so pleased that I was, we were flying with these, these Marines. They knew what they were doing. And then they quickly taught us a lot of these little cues and things that we should look for. Uh, even the way the Army taught us how to shoot the rockets was all bass backwards. Um, I learned sort of just by accident how to do it and do it right and, and be very, very accurate. So, and then that's the kind of stuff we'd pass on to each other with, uh, in the, at the evening in the club. So, uh, so flying with the Arvin observers, we had one of them who, as soon as we took off, he'd fall asleep, and he stayed that way for the whole flight till we landed. Uh, it's a good thing he didn't wake up the day that I low leveled the Ashaw Valley because he probably would have. I don't know what he would have done. Um, we had one of the one of the the, the three was a uh, an Arvin warrant officer, and we we kind of suspected that maybe he was colorblind because he could see stuff in the vegeta vegetation. It was very, very difficult to detect because he would rely on shape, different shapes, and where we're, we're being bombarded with the different colors that are down there. Um, one, he was the one who was the one Arvin observer that was that was worth flying with. Um, the other two, eh, and I preferred to fly the TAOR with the Marine in a back seat anyway. When we did the coastal runs, we had a, a naval, a Navy observer who had been to the same schools as our Marine Corps observers, but he was more interested in looking at boat traffic because it's all along the, we're, we're looking at the coast and, and there are a lot of fishermen and that kind of stuff out there. So he was looking at, he was interested in that kind of stuff. Although we did go out to Coolaray Island and I even took a set of scuba gear out there once. We had a navigation site out there that was run by a bunch of civilians. I remember coming in on short, finally guys down there snorkeling in the water. It wasn't really a combat. So it's 26 miles. Here's another thing. Tulare Island was 26 miles off the coast of Vietnam. We would go to Quang Nai, refuel. There wasn't a thing on that bird dog that would float. And without even thinking, you know, you take off and you, you, you point it east. You still can't see the island. It's 26 miles out there and it's kind of hazy. You, know? you fly out there until you see the island and then you... the FAA says if you're flying a single engine aircraft over water you have to be within gliding distance of the beach if the engine should quit <laughs> we were 26 we were miles nowhere, is that gliding yeah we were distance, nowhere so. within gliding distance you know we just been shark bait you know but we didn't think about that we're, oh heck let's just go out to Coolaray island and take these guys the mail you know when you're young and dumb that's, what, that's, what you, that's why they send young men to war yeah. Well, listen, you, you expressed, you talk about uh, dangerous flying situations. You expressed some very, I'm going to call them mixed feelings toward helicopters in your book. And which, by the way, I share, I, I have spent a lot of time in helicopters, uh, both here and oddly enough in Siberia. Just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> and I basically consider them to be flying rocks, right? You rode in a stops. Russian helicopter. I did, yeah. uh, twice, yeah. twice. Um, <laughs> And um, a Soviet era helicopter, in fact. Am I 18, probably? Uh, yeah, exactly. And um, but then it turns out that you became a helicopter pilot and spent a couple of thousand hours as a helicopter yeah. pilot. So what? What? Uh, what's the skinny here? 
<clears throat> okay. If you want to go someplace and get there, get in an airplane. If you want to go someplace and enjoy the ride, other than a combat zone, take a helicopter. I've flown light helicopters all the way across the United States from east to west and west to east. Never gotten more than 500 feet above the ground. This country of ours that we are so privileged to live in is so vast and so varied. It's just, it, it's, it's a true blessing to live here. It really is. And I've been able to see it. You drive on the freeway, you can only see, you know, half a mile in each direction. That's it. You go on a two lane highway, you probably even see less. You fly across the country in a jet, you're at 35,000 feet and everything looks like it, you know, it's so miniature. But you fly across the country at less than 500 feet, you're getting a taste of it. And uh, believe me, it's delicious. It really is. Now, helicopters in combat, and let me, let me, before I say another word, those young army pilots, few of them old enough to vote on their first tour in Vietnam, and a lot of them did more than one tour, were the bravest, most unselfish. They would fly straight into the jaws of hell to save somebody. And they did it day in and day out. And in the meantime, I guess there were, People at Woodstock getting high, smoking stuff. These guys, to get high, they just pull pitch on that helicopter, and up they go, and off they go. And uh, as as reflected in the book, uh, they were brave beyond measure. They really were. So, uh, Ray, one of the things that, again, I found the book to be fascinating and, and really enlightening about part of the war I knew nothing about. Why do you think it is that, you know, your experience and the experience of, of the guys in your unit has kind of not been talked about that much in the Vietnam Army. Like I said, everybody knows about helicopters. They know about different aspects. But the story of the Cestas and the bird dogs doesn't really pop up that often. Why do you, why do you think that is? Um, I, I think I can help you along that. When I graduated flight school in June of 1967, there were three, I believe, 365 students in the helicopter class that graduated that month. There were 51 of us in the fixed wing class. Um, most of us wound up flying bird dogs in Vietnam. Some guys got to go and fly the Mohawk uh, and that kind of stuff. But um, the ratio was, was basically seven to one coming out of flight school. The ratio of combat losses, and I'm talking Pilots, crew chiefs, flight engineers, flight medics, that, that encompasses all of the, the Army crew members, okay? The losses, helicopters over fixed wing was 27 to 1. Mm. It, 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 it's enormous. And so I, I really wasn't interested in flying helicopters in Vietnam simply because, you know, the survival instincts kind of kick in. Um, they didn't want, the bad guys didn't want me to see them once they saw me, once they knew that I saw them. But I was, by then, I was bringing stuff in on them. So, um, yeah, they'd shoot at us. And, and later on, some of the guys uh, that were there got there and flew right after I left. They actually flew bird dogs up to 30 miles into North Vietnam, 100 mile an hour airplane. And they got stuff shot at them mm. that you don't even want to think about. We did lose, we lost. Uh, Three flight crews, crews while I was there. We lost an, uh, another one right after I left. Uh, they were, there were two of them were shot down over North Vietnam. Um, one of them had to be there. The other one shouldn't have been there. But, you know, uh, I think we lost a total of about, in the six and a half years my unit existed, I think we lost eight or ten pilots, and that was it. So that's not that bad. So um, later on, I'm back in the United States. I'm in a reserve unit. They said, we don't have any fixed wing. We've got helicopters. And I said, okay, send me to helicopter school. So I went off and they taught me how to fly helicopters. And they're fun. They're a lot of fun. Um, I, I flew a lot of neat stuff. I flew Blackhawks for customs. I flew, I flew the Apache a little bit. You can see that thing right behind my head. There's the Apache thing. Um, I think I flew nine different helicopters in my flying career and 18 different airplanes in my flying career. So I've been very, very fortunate. 
Very well, fortunate. Ray, Ray Carroll, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us for this hour. It's really thank been you, fascinating. And thank you. I, I enjoyed reading the book a lot. So it's very, Good. very readable. I have about 18 questions I didn't get to, so but oh. no worries. So people can people can email me and, <laughs> and come up with their own. If questions. you want, if you want to put my email address out there, anybody that has any questions are free to. Uh, I will put I, it up on the Facebook page. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Let them email me, and I'll be more than happy to answer their questions. That would be uh, great. I'd I'll be I'd be there. more than happy to do that. And by the way, there's another book, A Hundred Feet Over Hill. That's the title. I, I, Tell us I, about the guys that put into North Vietnam. I and I know you've mentioned that, but listen, as one author to another, Ray, I'm going to tell you, mm. when you're doing an interview, promote your own book, okay? <laughs> which is called Cat Killer 3-2, an <laughs> army pilot flying for the Marines in the Vietnam War by Ray Carroll. Ray, thanks again for it's joining us. It's about to come out over. in audio version. Stand by. Do you read it yourself? Have I read the book? No. Yeah. I know. Did you <laughs> read no. it in the audio version? No, no, they have they hired a professional. Ah. So it's supposed to come out real soon. Okay. Well, for those check who it don't out. like to read, they can listen to it. There you go. Thank you, gentlemen. Check it out, guys. Thank, Thank you, Ray. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. Good luck. Okay. So and, and hey Ray, stick around. We'll come and say hi to you after the show's over if you're still there. But Chris, that was that we we started talking about Vietnam and it was a really unique perspective and I'm yes. really really happy that we got a chance to talk to to Ray Carroll and it is a real interesting book so everybody do check it out and I should mention that that we that we have another show next week it's shocking right they're gonna have did us you, back did, did you even figure if, if people if you like this show um, <laughs> if you like the last sixty shows you might like show sixty one. Uh, which is uh, we're going to talk about something called X Troop, which I have to say I know very little about. Uh, it's by Lee Garrett. And uh, X Troop is the story of a uh, unit, a pretty much a, a quote unquote British unit, but it's largely composed of Jewish refugees uh, from Europe. And it's a commando unit that gets uh, sort of sent back into action. And it's a really interesting story that she has researched. And so we will check that out and uh, and be back in in the confines of, of uh, World War II come next week. Yes. So uh, anything else that we need to mention, Chris? Uh, um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yep. Tell friends and family to subscribe to our YouTube channel so it's not just me talking to Rick. Right. And History Happy, Happy Hour, Hour YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. We, you can find it. You can do it. And uh, and you all got here. So we had a bunch of people here were here. So we haven't lost everybody at our transfer. <laughs> Maybe a few angry people going, where's History Happy Hour? But, you know, they'll find it eventually. They'll find it eventually. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe.